beginning, just to explain, has been composed especially for the symposium by the leading Norwegian composer, uh, Lasse Thuresen, who is also an ecological composer, at least he considers himself to be so, uh, and um, he, it's been performed as always with a superb brio, as you've seen, by the flutist virtuoso Mike and Matthias and Schau. So once again, thank you very much, Lasse. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before I briefly introduce our extraordinary RNS professor uh, in 2021, Julia Cage, I'd like to invite pr the prorector, Osa Gunitska, to officially open the symposium. Dear friends, dear distinguished guests, welcome to the University of Oslo and to the old festive hall, Gamle Festival. And what a way to spend a Thursday night in company with, um, with, in, in present with such prominent speakers and in the also the memory of a scholar who really put a lasting mark on his academic field. Who, someone who challenged the conventional and acted unconventionally. I think that's the kind of a challenging spirit that's needed to address tonight's topic, rethinking democracy. I can't think of a more important and relevant topic to discuss. And democracy may be valued for its intrinsic virtues that the people should write their own laws, have access to individual freedom, and be able to participate in politics. And the attention paid to majority rule and electoral competition is well justified. Yet, such a focus misses some of the basic tensions and inherent and enduring tensions in democracies between majority rule and the concern for those who are especially affected by majority decisions. Tensions caused by politicians who tend to make myopic decisions that are blind to the interests of future generations and the, and the future of the planet. We see also a tension in the use of expertise faced with political and ideological convictions. Such tensions complicate matters in rethinking democracy and let alone reforming democracy. The robustness of democracies also depends on its instrumental value. Does democracy really make a difference? Does it deliver on what matters to people? Health, good education, decent work, economic growth, protecting the biosphere. Does it produce the quality of life that we cherish? Or are we maybe expecting too much? Do democracies produce political inequalities that in turn will lead to the erosion of our democratic political orders. Maybe we should already light an emergency flare for democracy. And I need not to remind you of a certain virus hmm, that has turned into a highly uncomfortable experiment in how different governance systems are able to deal with crises. Institutions that make up political orders today are truly put to the test. 
So, dear colleagues, this brings me back to the festive hall, to the site of the university, a university founded before the Norwegian constitution, before the national parliament, and it has played a, a significant role in establishing an independent nation state, also contributing to the emerging democratic political order in this country. So what better place to welcome a scholar with heart and head for rethinking democracy? And a passion, uh, combining, uh, Julia Cagé combines analytical clarity with passion for action, passion for making democracies sustainable. These themes are uh, such a perfect fit for the University of Oslo's sustainability agenda. The agenda that we have in our research, in our teaching and learning, and when we engage in the public debate. So I can't wait anymore. <laughs> Let's get started. Thank you so much. Uh, now, some of you who uh, were with us last time at the virtual symposium uh, remember Anthony Giddens, or Lord Anthony Giddens, uh, uh, the 2020 Ananas Professor, who in his usual inventive flair uh, described our time as the era of digidemic, right? Uh, a COVID-induced partly electronic pandemic which would radically transform global health, political culture, and work life. As usual, he was partly right, only partly, because we always quarrel with Anthony. Uh, uh, we are still in the middle of the transformation and its after effects, I think, and in this sense, he was right. Uh, it is enough to look at our half empty or half full, if you wish to be a, a, an optimist, auditorium, which has been controlled by the, uh, con uh, uh, by the COVID rules. But not everything is about gloom and doom. Uh, this year's RNS professor, Julia Cagé, uh, has been uh, passionate about creating antibodies against the assorted maladies of modern democracies, problems which the digidemic made more acute, than, you know, especially today, like uh, especially growing inequality, social and environmental injustice, the erosion of independent media, which is also a topic uh, I hope she's going to take up, and democracy's midlife crisis, as I call it, to mention, but, but a few uh, of such challenges. Julia belongs to a rare species of, uh, of uh, intellectuals. I'm very grateful to Julia, uh, to, to Eva, Jolie, who actually drew my attention to Julia's books and her research and her thinking. So thank you, uh, Eva. Uh, because her writing is cast uh, not in this kind of very fashionable necrological genre and gravesite orations on dying democracy, dying humanity, dying planet, all these things. Uh, her work brims with innovative ideas about how to boost equality, renew democracy, by giving more power to the powerless and reanimating one of the fundaments of democracy, um, independent media. In short, she is the embodiment of Arne Ness's much quoted motto, think dutifully, act beautifully. Okay, so you should remember this motto, Julian. You should write it down immediately. Or Thomas, you write it down. Julia is the author of such ground, groundbreaking works as The Price of Democracy, and saving the media, just to mention the two of them, which apart from rigorous statistics and very rigorous thinking, show intellectual muscle, I would say, wit and determination to fight the wicked collusion of money and power in politics, uh, which leads the, to, to the fact that the poor are becoming poorer while financing the rich. Today, Julia is going to speak about the ways of reimagining democracy for our time through a set of steps towards social and environmental justice. Julia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, invitation. I am very glad to uh, be here. I guess this is the first time I uh, 
took a flight uh, for traveling since kind of like two years <laughs> and give a speech uh, in public. <laughs> so it's kind of like uh, wonderful and it's a rare event uh, now. Uh, I would like in particular to uh, thank uh, Nina uh, Vitovzek for the uh, invitation and for the very nice uh, introduction. I also would like to uh, thank Eva Jolie. Uh, I, I was particularly uh, glad uh, when Nina told me that Eva was going to uh, discuss the talk because on top of being uh, intellectual Norwegian, she's a superstar French politician. Uh, so for, for a French academics, you know, it really um, uh, means something. And also I would take this uh, opportunity to, like, to thank my uh, husband Thomas, who uh, as always like, came with me uh, to like, discover a new country because this is uh, uh, my first time uh, in Oslo. And also to have this uh, opportunity to talk uh, uh, to you uh, and with you to discuss with you. And thanks also to the two students uh, who accepted uh, to uh, participate in the, in the, in the panel. Uh, to try to have some like a new uh, thinking with you about uh, the renewal of, uh, of democracy. Uh, as Nina told you, part of this talk will be based on uh, my book uh, that is called The Price of Democracy that was published three years ago in uh, France and uh, last year uh, in English as well as uh, on the more uh, recent books that for now is uh, just still in French. So in French it's called Libre and uh, Ego en Voix and I guess in English it would be translated as something like um, a free and equal in terms of voice. Uh, and we would talk a lot about like money in politics, but also about uh, what can be done to give uh, more voice and more equality uh, to each uh, citizen in the way uh, they can participate in the, in the political debate. So the, the departure point of my research is the following, is the fact that uh, we, I guess we all agree, which is not like such a good news if you lo look at uh, all uh, Western democracies uh, at least, uh, about the fact that uh, there is a crisis of representation that you can uh, see in a number of different ways. Uh, either when you look at political participation, uh, that is very weak, and we see that uh, people go less and less uh, uh, to vote in elections, in particular because they no longer trust uh, politicians. Uh, and uh, this uh, crisis of representation, for me, is partly due uh, to the fact uh, that the democratic game is captured by uh, private interest, and in particular is captured by uh, private money. Uh, this is a departure point, but the thing is, uh, we can learn a lot from history, and we can learn a lot from what is happening around the world. So what I try to do in uh, my book uh, is to look at history, to look at the past uh, 50, 60, 70 years, to try to understand what has been done in different countries, to reduce the weight of private interest in politics, to reduce the weight of private interest in the media industry, uh, to reduce uh, the power of like philanthropy that can be seen as a negative power of uh, money in a certain sense, and to try to learn from all these different uh, experiences uh, to uh, have solution, to try to improve the way our democratic systems uh, work. Uh, and I'm going to uh, give you a sense of like what happened and what is the situation today in terms of uh, crisis of representation and in particular the weight uh, money has uh, in politics. And then I'm going to try to go through uh, in the time I have uh, a number of different solutions. The first one being the democratic equality vouchers, uh, which is a new egalitarian and dynamic pu public funding scheme. And the idea is to give each citizen the same power in terms of funding of the democratic game. Uh, then we will talk about the philanthropic uh, equality uh, vouchers for the funding of the non-profit sector. And I think when we will tackle the issue of environmental justice, uh, it will be a, a key aspect uh, we have to dealt with. Uh, we will also talk uh, what I call the mixed assembly, uh, and the idea here is to have a more equal representation, and in particular the fact that if you look at the assemblies and all the parliaments uh, as of today uh, in the world, we are doing a little bit better now uh, than in the past uh, in terms of women representation, but now if you look at the working class, it's even worse now than what it was in the past, and the working class has never well been represented uh, in parliaments uh, during the past like 200 centuries of uh, democracy and we will uh, finish uh, with a couple of words about uh, the media, uh, which is also a theme that I uh, really liked to, uh, to work uh, on. So the, the, the departure point uh, is very simple, but I, I think we need to keep that in mind, uh, which is the fact that uh, democracy has a cost. 
And so we need money for democracy to work. We need money for two things. We need money for campaign, and political campaigns are important because you want politicians to be able to reach and convince citizens. And democracy also has a cost because we need to fund the political movements and we need to fund the political parties. But this cost can vary a lot from one place to the other. Here are just a couple of examples when, where you see how much we spent, like per, in per capita term, in per adult terms, uh, for different political parties in Germany, uh, Belgium, Spain, France, Italy, in the UK uh, in recent years. Uh, the fact that democracy has a cost, it does not mean that uh, we don't have to uh, regulate this cost. The last presidential elections in the US, they costed more than $3 billion. And I guess there is a better way to spend $3 billion as of today uh, than to do politics. But it also means that we need to think about the way we want to fund democracy. And it's a little bit the same thing for uh, democracy and for the media. When you tend to consume information, you read newspaper online, and you don't pay for the newspapers you read, because now you have the impression that information is free, you should wonder who is ready to pay to produce an information that I'm going to consume freely, but that is costly to produce. And very often the answer is some billionaires. So you can say, oh, how nice are they? They're ready just to lose money to give me information to consume for free. Or you might think, perhaps they don't do it for free, but they do it because when they fund the media, they gain some political power at the same time. And it's a little bit the same thing for democracy. I'm always having a hard time, and I think I'm having a hard time now because it's hard to tell people we should spend more public money to fund political parties. And it's very hard because people they no longer trust politicians because the political life uh, might be corrupted. And so people think that there are better ways to spend the public money than to fund political parties. But the thing is, if democracy as a cost, we don't want billionaires or millionaires to pay for this cost. Because when they spend money on funding politics, they don't do that as philanthropists. They do that because they are expecting something in exchange. So I really do think that if we want democracy to be defined as one person, one vote, and not to be defined as one dollar, one euro or one kroner, one vote, we need to think better the way we pay for it. The thing is, as of today, if you look at a number of different countries in the world, there are a lot of private money in politics. And this private money in politics is not equally distributed among citizens. If you look at a country like the US, what do you see? In a country like the US, if you look at the top 0.01% of the people, very rich people, in terms of revenues, they have the equivalent of 5% of the total revenues, which is already huge, you know, like in an equal world, like the top 0.01% of the people, they should have 0.01% uh, of the revenues, they have 5%. Now, if you look at how much they spent in terms of political donations, you see that they represent more than 40% of the campaign contributions. So nearly half of all the private money in US politics, which is going to give them a huge political power. That's the US. And so very often we think, like in a number of European countries, like in Germany or in France, we tend to say, yeah, but the U.S. is a counterexample. You know, in the U.S., politics is under, like, uh, money control. But in Europe, we were clever enough to better regulate politics. So it's of interest to look at what is happening in a country like France. In a country like France, the situation is very different from what it is in the U.S. And also, by the way, I'm going to come back to that from what it is in Norway where in Norway there is no limit 
to how much private individuals or corporations can give to politics. In France, there are some limits. In France, you cannot give more than 7,500 euros a year to political parties and 4,600 euros to political campaigns. And so we have this idea that this should make everyone equal in front of politics. But this is not the case. What is this limit? 7,500 euros from one person. With a couple, it's 15,000 euros. If you add how much people can give to different political campaigns, it means that for like a presidential election, uh, legislative election cycle in France, you can have some people who are going to give up to nearly like 50,000 euros to some political parties. They are free to do so. And we have this idea that everybody is free to fund politics. But that's not true. If you are just making the minimum wage, you are not free to give 7,500 euros to political parties, just because you don't have the money. And this is where the inequality comes from. We have the impression that everyone can give money. And if you look at, like, in US politics, you have this idea that we shouldn't limit the weight of money into the political life because money is free speech. And everybody should be free to express his political opinions. And the same way, everybody should be free to spend money on political parties. But everybody is free to express his political or her political opinions. But not everybody is free to give a couple of thousand euros to a political party because a lot of people, they just don't have enough money to do so. And now if you look at this plot for France, it looks exactly the same way the plot for the US looks like. It means that even with these limitations in terms of like 7,000 euros, in France, you will have on average less than 1% of the population if you look at all the population that contribute to political parties. But this is the case of more than 12.5% of the citizens that are in the top 0.01% in terms of revenues. And on average, they tend to give 40 times more than the average citizens in terms of revenues. And you know, this is for France, but if you go through like the book, you would say exactly the same kind of plots in terms of shape. If you look at the United Kingdom, where similarly I plot the donations to political parties, depending on the size of revenues of the different citizens, or if you look at Germany. So in all the different Western democracies, and in fact here I'm telling you Western democracies because this is the, 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 the side of the world that I know the best in terms of research, but uh, from what I, I have been doing on like uh, Brazil or India, you have the same kind of situation and the same kind of uh, issue. So in all these uh, countries, what you see is that the more money people have, the more they spend on politics. And so in a sense, I'm going to come back to that, the more political power they might have. Then who is going to benefit from these donations? Because after all, if all the different political parties were enjoying the same kind of amount of money from all these different kinds of political parties, then you would say, who cares? Okay? At the end of the day, it's going to benefit the left, the green, the center, the right. So it's just a different way to spend money. But this is not what we observe in the data. If you look at the data in all the different countries, so here you have Germany, you have Belgium, you have Spain, France, Italy, you have the UK. What you see is that the pro-business parties, they tend to receive much more donations than the left-wing parties. Which in a, in a sense it's kind of obvious. Because if you have a lot of money, and you spend this money on politics, very often is to push for an agenda. And your agenda tends to be like, oh, let's have a little bit less tax, rather than, oh, let's have a little bit less inequality. No. This said, I want to say, and this is where it's like even more complicated, you also have a lot of, in particular, corporations, you have a lot of corporate donors that tend 
to finance political parties, both on the left and on the right, at the same time. From this point of view, the case of Germany is very interesting. The first thing that you see on the graph is that you know the, 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 the pies for Germany are much bigger than for the other countries, except the UK. Because in both Germany and the UK, there is no limit to private donations. Now, if you look at corporate donors in Germany, you see all the car industry, all the pharmaceutical industry, and you will see a company, for example, like uh, Philip Morris. And all these different companies, there is transparency in Germany, so we have the information. Very often, they make a donation every year at the same time, and they make the same kind of donation to the SPD, to the Socialist Party, to the CDU, to the FDP, to the CSU, which might seem a, a little bit strange as a voter, no? Because as a voter, when you go to the pool and you vote for the left, you don't vote for the right. Or you might choose to vote for the right, but you are not going to vote for the left. But the thing is, when they do that, they don't want to favor one party rather than the other. What they want to do is to buy an insurance policy. And by doing so, they are sure that whether the right or the left is going to win the election, the regulations that are going to be put in place, in place are not going to be too harmful for them, in particular when we turn to the environmental regulations. Okay. This has a second negative consequence, which is the following. Don't try to, 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 to read the table, I don't know why it's kind of <laughs> turn right. Uh, is that if you look at a number of left-wing parties, for example, in the US, the Democratic Party, or in the UK, the Labour Party, or in Italy, the Democratic Party, in a sense also in France, where we uh, had before the Socialist Party, and where like a lot of politicians from this Socialist Party they just moved uh, to uh, the presidential camp, which is much more on the right, what do we see? We see a move of all these left-wing parties towards pro-business issues. And why do they move towards pro-business issues? Because they are looking for money. They need to raise money. And they know that to raise money from a certain number of donors, they need to be more pro-business, which is the only way for them to be funded. And this is something that is very well documented. It does not mean that the same billionaires are going to fund the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate in the US, for example. But we have a number of surveys of billionaire preferences. And you see that the, these billionaires, they differ a lot in terms of preferences when you talk about cultural issues or issues linked to society. Gay marriage, for example, or the issue of abortion or even all the things that is linked to uh, the fact of having guns or guns prohibition. So if you are a Democrat, you would be more in favor of the gay marriage. If you are a Republican, you would be much more conservative. But in terms of business issue, they will tend both to focus on pro-business position. And what I was trying to show you on this plot that you cannot read, it explains why during the, the past, like, uh, 30 or 40 years in Western democracies or in a country like the US, there have been no reduction in economic inequality, even when the left was back to power. Because all the policies that were implemented, in particular in terms of like tax policies to reduce inequality, was very shy, to say the less, the less on the democratic side. Then there is one more aspect uh, to that, that Nina already alighted, but I think it's important to insist on that. So what uh, have I shown you until now? The first thing that I have said is that democracy has a cost. We need to pay for democracy, and you see that as of today, the rich tend to spend much more money on funding political parties than the poor, in particular because they are allowed to do so. There is not enough limitations and there is no enough regulation of campaign finance. 
This tends to benefit mainly the pro-business political parties, and this also leads the left-wing political parties a little, a little bit more to the right, in particular when we talk about economics. But there is one additional aspect that I want to highlight. In a very large number of countries, not only the rich do spend more money on politics than the poor, but the poor pay for it. Why? Because you have tax credit associated with political donations. So for example, in France, if you give 6,000 euros to a political party, the state is going to give you back 4,000 euros, two thirds of your donation, and you are just going to spend like 2,000 euros from your own pocket. It's even worse than that in France. Because in France, to be eligible to this tax credit, you need to be part of the bottom 50, of, of the top 50% of the income distribution. So now if you are in the bottom 50% of the income distribution, first of all, you are not going to give 6,000 euros. And I really want to insist on this because you cannot do that even if you really want to be involved in politics, you don't have enough money to do that. So perhaps you are going to give 300 euros and then you will pay 300 euros because you are not eligible to the tax credit. In a country like France as of today, we spend as much money on the public funding of political parties, around 16 million euros, one euro per adult, that in terms of tax credit in exchange of political donations. And in this case, we spend up to 3,000 euros per adult. And we have this completely like regressive system where the state pay much more money to satisfy the political preferences of the rich than the political preferences of the majority of the population. I want to add that even in countries where we don't have tax credit for political donations, you have tax credit for political donations in France. You have some in Spain, you have them in Germany, you have them in Italy, you don't have them in the United Kingdom or in the US. But in these countries, it does not mean that the state do not spend more money to satisfy the political preferences of the rich compared to the one of the poor. It does so, but through tax credit associated to donations to the non-profit sector. And I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk, because very often when we talk about the funding of the non-profit sector, we just talk about like philanthropy. But there is a lot of politics in philanthropy, in particular when you look, for example, at the funding of different think tanks. I think the third important point that needs to be highlighted in terms of the funding scheme of today's democracies is that if we consider these public funding schemes, it tends to favor existing parties. Why? Because the public funding schemes of political parties tends to be based on election results. So for example, in Norway, as of today, if you look at the public funding at the national level, the government grants are going to be distributed at an equal amount of, depending on the number of votes obtained in the last parliamentary election. The thing is, parliamentary elections, they are going to take place every four years or every five years. But you can have a lot of new political movements that are going to be created in between. Okay, the political life is not frozen by uh, five year times intervals. And so we have this issue where in a number of democracies, like Norway, like France, it's very hard for a new political movement to make it to the elections just because it's not receiving any public money because we have this way to spend the public money based on the past electoral results why we should take into account the evolution of the political landscape in between two elections. Last point, 
And I think this is also, also something that I want to alight here in the slow. You have countries where you have regulation and you have where you have limitations to how much parties can spend or how much you can give to political parties. And you have countries where it is not the case. It's not the case in Germany, it's not the case in the US, in the UK, and it's not the case in Norway. And in these countries where it is not the case, the argument is very often to say that we don't need to limit donations because we have transparency. So we have information. We know how much different political parties receive and we know the identity of the donors. Transparency is important and it should be introduced everywhere, but transparency is not enough. It's not enough to know that this corporation or this individual gave one or two million euros to a given political party to limit the fact that this individual or corporation is going to receive something in exchange. If you have transparency, it's much more obvious to limit direct corruption, you know, what we call quid pro quo corruption. So, for example, you are a corporation, you make a gift to a political party, perhaps the day after you are not going to receive a big uh, government contract. This is quid pro quo corruption. But we know that a lot of corruption is uh, much less obvious than quid pro quo corruption. We don't see that directly, but you are going to have part of the population that is going to obtain some advantage in exchange of this political funding. Okay. On top of that, and then I'm going to turn to the optimist side of the lecture. Don't worry. I'm uh, all going to cry at some point. Uh, we care about this issue of the funding of democracy and the cost of democracy because it plays a role in elections. If you go on the website for the, the book, uh, so, so, so you can go on thepriceofdemocracy.com, we have done the job for France and we have done the job for the UK. For the UK, you can move back to 80, 57, so we have 150 years of UK data, okay? If you go on this website, what you will see is that for each legislative elections, we have computed how much different candidates spent in terms of campaigning, and we have computed the share of the vote they receive. For each of the elections we have, so we have all the legislative elections in France since 1993. We have all the mayoral elections in France since uh, 1995. We have all the parliamentary elections in the UK since 1857. We have more than 60 parliamentary elections in the UK. For all these elections, you would see the same exact kind of plot where you have a 45 degree line between how much candidates spent and the probability of winning the election. And I would be glad at some point to get the data from Norway to do the same because I'm sad enough to think that we will find the same kind of correlation, which is one more reason that we might want to regulate democracy. I was exchanging a lot and Eva and Nina was nice enough to send me a lot of information during the, the, the past couple of weeks uh, about the last uh, elections in Norway, which I found really fascinating, in particular because this election had the environmental issues at its core. This was won, but you know that better than I, by the Labour Party. And the bad surprise, at least for a number of us, was the very low score obtained by the Green. It's hard to know exactly the role money played in this election, but what is sure is that if you look at the data, because at least you have transparency in Norway, so we already have some figure, the Labour Party got much more donations from private and corporate donors than the Green, and it even got much more donations than the right-wing party and than the center party. So I guess at some point it would be of interest to try to study the role these donations from private and corporate donors had during this, uh, these elections. Okay. So what are these, the consequences of, of all that? The, fi the fact that democracy has a cost, it tends to be funded by the rich, and we lack regulations in a number of countries. 
The main consequence is the fact that the politicians tend to take into account the preferences of the most affluent. You have like a very nice book published by US politi um, uh, politist who call this phenomena, and I really like it, democracy by coincidence. Why do they mean by democracy by coincidence? They mean that on a number of different issues, the preference of the rich and the preference of the poor, they are going to coincide. Okay. So when you ask people, like through survey data, do you want this regulation or do you want this uh, change? And if you look in terms of revenues, you won't have any difference in terms of preference expressed depending on the revenues. And they say, this is the good news. This is a coincidence. Because each time there is no coincidence between the preference, and you look at the policies implemented by the governments, they tend to go in the direction of the preferences of the affluent. And I think why, one of the reasons why we see such a huge crisis of representation as of today is that there is less and less coincidence between the preferences of the poor and the preferences of the rich. On environmental issue, this is very clear. You see that the majority of the population tend to make a lot of effort. Even the part of the population who already, you know, consume much less because they are financially constrained than the affluent. And at the same time, now you have some billionaires that decide to spend a couple of days uh, doing space tourism. And I think this would be a huge problem for the democratic system per se. Because if at some point people no longer decide to go and vote, we don't really know what is going to happen. So in front of that, and this is why I tend to have a hard time, the solution that has been implemented in a number of countries was to decide that at least, given we don't trust politicians, and given politicians tend to favor the political preferences of the rich, let spend less money on the public funding of democracy. This is what we saw in Italy in recent decades. So here I show you how much public money was spent per adult in Italy for the funding of democracy since 1974, where it was first introduced. And basically, the amount as of today is equal to zero. In 2016, the Italian government decided no longer to fund political campaigns, and they decided a couple of years ago no longer to fund political parties. And you have exactly the same thing in the US. So in the US, people completely forgot uh, that they were the very first, in fact, to introduce public funding for their political campaigns. And this was done through the presidential fund. And for years, this was the way presidential campaigns were funded in the US. And as of today, only private money is used to fund the elections. When you saw that in the US, the first election without private money was the one that led uh, Donald Trump to power, you might think that, indeed, this is what we shouldn't do. So what should we do? First thing, we have an issue. The issue is the fact that the rich are paying for the democratic life. So we need to reform campaign finance. First thing, we need to limit private donations. But we need to really limit private donations, okay? Remember what I showed you for France. Like a couple of thousand euros is already too much if you want an equal representation of all the citizens. So what can we do? I think we should introduce a drastic limit on private donations. And I say no more than 2,000 uh, no more than 200 euros per year and per voter. We can discuss the amount, the exact amount, okay? I don't care about like 150 or 250 euros. Okay, 200 euros is already a very large a financial effort for a large number of citizens, so perhaps we want it to be a little bit less, but we don't want this amount to be much more. And I really think that we need to put drastic limits on private donations. Then money has a cost, uh, democracy has a cost, okay? So if we limit private funding, we need to have enough public money. 
But the thing is that we want this public money first to be equally done to each citizen. Okay. So we want each citizen to have the same amount of public money. And the second thing that we want is that we want to avoid one of the limits of today's system, that is to favor existing parties and not to fund new political movements. So I propose to take the amount of money that is used today to fund, in particular, the preferences of private individuals and to give each citizen a democratic equality vouchers that he can allocate each year to the political parties of her choice. Okay. And this will allow to have equal political funding with the renewal of the political life and the apparition of new political parties, and also to have much more stability than what we see as of today. This idea, because I told you, you know, at the beginning, now I did not really have time to enter into all the details that I, I do this tour of the world and I look uh, into the history. But this idea is not something that I had one morning out of my mind. This is really based on experience that had advantages and also limits. This is based on, for example, the democratic equality vouchers that were introduced in 2016 in the city of Seattle in the US. And that works pretty well. So the city of Seattle said, okay, there is no way at the federal level to regulate campaign finance. Let's do it locally. And locally, they decided for the mayoral election to allocate all the citizens' vouchers worth 25 euros that they can give to the candidate of their choice. And then the candidate has to say no to all the private donations. If you look at the candidates who ran for this election in 2016 and who, who made it, uh, to the elections, you have much more uh, uh, representativeness than before the introduction of these vouchers. And this is where I come to my second proposal, because the crisis of democracy is not only linked to money, you have a huge money problem, but you also have uh, a crisis of representation that is linked to the radical exclusion of the working, working class from the parliament. I'm just showing you one example from the UK. In the UK, like uh, between 1950 and today, in 1950, you had between 15 and 20 percent of the member of the parliament than, uh, who came from the working class. As of today, it's below 5 percent. It was divided by three. This is not linked to uh, the Conservative Party. For them, it was always kind of close to zero. So they don't have any like working class representative. But what is really striking is that if you look at the Labour Party, the Labour Party in 1950, more than, two, more than one third of their MPs came from the working class. And this was a time when the Labour Party in the UK was funded by the unions. As of today, the Labour Party in the UK is no more funded by the unions, but by the corporate donors. And what we see is that the share of uh, candidates from the uh, working class background was divided by uh, more than two, okay? We are not doing better in France, huh? In France, we are always being super low. So at least there is no real change. Since 1958 in France, we have never seen more than 10% of blue collar workers making it to the parliament. As of today, if you look at blue collar workers in the parliament in France, but you won't find them because there is zero. Okay, third thing, and now I, I see Nina with the clock, so I'm going to go like very quickly, and we'll have the discussion. I'm concluding, I'm, like one minute. So, so. Yeah, I'm going to look uh, this way. <laughs> <laughs> Third thing is what I call the uh, uh, philanthropic equality vouchers. I, I, I thought a lot about it, and this is one of the main differences between the price of democracy and my following book. And the price of democracy, I was like, okay, we need to equalize the public funding for the political life. And then I worked more and more, not only on politics, political parties, but also on think tanks and on all the different ways rich people can use their money to influence uh, the political debate. And what we see is that this bias we have in terms of funding of democracy, we spend much more public money to favor the, the political preferences of the rich. We have exactly the same thing when you look at the funding of the non-profit sector. And I think we should have the same kind of solution. 
If you look now at all the amount that are spent in terms of tax credit for the funding of the non-profit sector, in a country like France, every year we spend 2.4 billion euros in terms of tax credit in philanthropic tax subsidies. This is equal to 44 euros per citizen. I think we should replace this tax credit scheme by an equal philanthropic equality vouchers worth 44 euros given each year to each citizen that he can allocate to the political parties of his choice. And I think that this will lead uh, to a change in how much different non-profit organizations receive. And in particular, this might benefit uh, non-profit organizations fighting for the cl climate. I'm not going to insist too much on uh, media, uh, but I, I just want to say like a, a small words, in particular because, and, and then we debate uh, media to, together. Yeah, because Eva, you know, when we were talking about the uh, last uh, elections in Norway, she highlighted to me the role played by uh, the disclosure of this uh, Ristad report uh, that uh, claimed before the elections that, in fact, if Norway was to reduce its production of oil and gas, CO2 emissions in the world would increase. And the disclosure of this report a couple of weeks before the election was not made by chance, and this really should... Um, we should put at the center of the debate the impact media coverage have on the choice made by voters. And so I also have, but we will do that later, uh, I would also be glad to discuss at some point what we should do in terms of democratizing media ownership. Because I really think that if we do not democratize media ownership, and in particular the funding of the media, it won't be possible it won't be possible to reach political equality and social and environmental justice. And to do so, we need to equalize the funding of political parties. We need to equalize the funding of the non-profit sectors that more and more is used as a political, political tools by people who have money. And we also need a radical democratization of the media. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia, for this riveting lecture. Uh, it was extremely packed, uh, but I hope we will uh, manage to unpack some of the uh, issues during the debate. What I would like uh, now, our technician, who is, where is our genius technician? Yes, please, to start uh, um, talking to our uh, participants in what I call a fireside debate. Now, the fireside debate is not my invention. It's used by the, it's a very fashionable term now, used by the Future Labs, and it means that it's a civilized conversation uh, based on um, getting high on ideas, not on, on drinks, and on a gentle disagreement between uh, the different parties. So I would like to invite, uh, or to put around the fire, uh, I know that it's uh, absurd to imagine a fire in the fireplace in the center of uh, the, uh, this wonderful, splendid hall, but you are Norwegians, so it shouldn't be too problematic. So let's say there is a fireplace there, and uh, then there are the guests uh, and the participants of our debate, uh, also the guests, the fireplace guests, and I'd like to invite uh, Eva Jolie, to uh, have a seat, please. She's one of our fireside uh, um, chatty ladies. Uh, as you know, she's extremely chatty. Uh, then we have Lars Tregor, who is, now, no, now the, I don't need to introduce uh, Eva Jolie to Norwegian audience. Uh, the Norwegians are as much in love with her as the French, I hope. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and uh, the next star in our around our fireplace is Lars Tregor, who is a historian and a public intellectual in uh, in Sweden, a professor at one of the universities uh, in Stockholm. Uh, and he has a mind that always reminded me of a, a sparkling chilled prosecco. So he is very breezy and very Californian, in spite of being Swedish. 
And then we have uh, two uh, students from the, uh, from the Center for Development and the Environment, which is uh, actually the um, mother of all mothers uh, of this symposium. Uh, that's where Ananes uh, was housed for a very long time. And uh, th these are two proud Ananes grant holders, uh, Sanne van der Boom from uh, Netherlands. Uh, this is a very international institute. Let me tell you, it's one of the most interesting, vibrant institutions at Oslo University. And uh, the German scholar, young scholar, uh, Hendrik Pröll, uh, who is uh, also an RNS grant holder. So I get a lot of mileage from the RNS grant holders. Noblesse oblige. Uh, so here uh, is our fireside uh, uh, task uh, force. Uh, and I would like to maybe to start from uh, Lange by asking you a very concrete question. Now, you are a well-known expert on the Nordic model, especially its Swedish version. Now, to what extent are Julia's visionary ideas relevant for renewing uh, democracy in Sweden, if not in Scandinavia? And Julia talks about the crisis of representation in uh, which haunts democracy. Do you agree? The Nordics uh, you know, suffer a great deal from what we can call, or Freud called, the narcissism of minor differences. So one does not want to venture into, as a Swede, saying anything about Norway. So, um, so I'm going to say a few words about Sweden. Um, I think, first of all, there, there has been, as far as I know, uh, we really know serious debate around private financing of political parties or campaigns. Uh, there's been a little, there was a little bit about 10 years ago, there were some complaints from the right that the Social Democrats got too much money from the labor unions, and on the other hand, the left complain about uh, maybe money coming into the right-wing parties from, the, from business interest. But uh, that resulted in a kind of a strengthening of, of disclosure, uh, transparency, reforms, and since then there hasn't been much of that. Now I did look a little bit after uh, uh, reading uh, Julia, uh, what it actually looks like in Sweden with respect to funding, public and private, and what we can think of as other. <laughs> And, and what you find is interesting there, because the, the only party that sort of stands out in terms of private funding is actually the left party, the old communist party. Uh, and that's because they have an internal party tax. <laughs> so their, their you know, political figures actually have to pay, sort of like we used to do with the church. You know, you pay a tenth of your, your income to the church. So it's a bit of a kind of socialist version, a sort of secular version of that. Um, if you look at the, the uh, two parties with the most money, uh, the Social Democrats and the Center Party, the old agrarian party, these are the old two social movement parties, uh, uh, they, they have uh, a lot of money, and it's an interesting mixed bag. If we look at the Social Democrats, for example, uh, half of their income comes from their lottery systems. And a lottery is interesting because, of course, it is a... Uh, for, for many people in the middle class, it's like slightly vulgar and suspect, you know, and it's true that they tend to run some of their members into a bankruptcy through that. But all in all, it is, of course, an eminently democratic way of raising money, right? There certainly is no uh, concentration of interest here, you know, it's very distributed. The other one is membership, uh, which again, of course, comes back to what uh, the Nordic countries have, which is different from the rest, really, of Europe, which is a very strong civil society. Uh, it, so, you know, that's another uh, funding source. And then you have, of course, the public funding, uh, which is big. Um, and uh, you have also some endowments that are too proper to the parties, particularly the center party and the Social Democrats have, as that where they take a certain profit out of that. Uh, so that is where the package, and, and there is very little in the way of uh, private donations. Um, Part of that is because, you know, something that Julia mentioned, that there, there, there is in Sweden, well, you didn't mention the Swedish case, but in Sweden there is, there are no tax deductions for any type of giving, right? Because the idea in Sweden is that if you're going to give, you have to give post-tax, so to speak. Right? There's no reason that citizens should be funding other people's generosity, right? So the very reality of Sweden stands out. Norway has a, a limited uh, for gifts. Um, uh, 
uh, that, uh, that you don't have in Sweden. So in, in general here, what we see then is a picture which doesn't quite fit in um, with the story you're telling, which doesn't mean that your story is not very, very important, right? But it is not a very good fit uh, with respect uh, uh, to, to Sweden. Um, and uh, I think that's maybe something that, you know, I think for me, one of the very important things uh, with the kind of research that you do, and this has always bothered me a little bit being, living in the US, is that, you know, one takes some of the big countries, you know, as the case, and, and generalizes from that. And I think in this particular case, it's very good that you're gonna be here right now, you know, because there is a good case, actually, if you wanna improve the world, to start in the places where things actually seem to work pretty well, right? Uh, instead of sort of basing the analysis on uh, those cases, right, the US in particular, that are sort of, obviously, it's dysfunctional. Um, so, so those are my initial, you know, uh, uh, comments. The American dream is more alive in the Nordic countries than in the US. What do you mean by that? Um, and I think it's important here to understand that the, the, this Nordic or the Swedish social contract is not a welfare state in the welfare sense that you, you use that word in English in the US and so forth. Uh, there are no free lunches, so to speak, right? It's not primarily about distribution of wealth. It's about wealth creation. So it's, it's a social investment state. You know, the idea is to promote not absolute equality of outcome, but rather equality of opportunity, right? And so this is where it ties into the American dream. And, and so from that, you know, follows, and this is a decision made all in the early 1930s, really, the, the Social Democratic Party, that you do not want to go down the road, right, uh, of killing, you know, the goose that's laying the, the golden egg. You know, you just want to pluck it, but in a way that minimizes the hissing and you know, maximizes the wealth creation. And, and so therefore, the rich, the companies, and so forth, have been included in the social contract you know, in Sweden for a very long time. Uh, you, don't, you don't think of them as the enemy. You don't talk about sort of taxing the rich or anything of that sort. You don't, you don't demonize the rich. You do not demonize the rich. Mm -hmm. And they, we actually have a tax system that uh, is interesting because we have a low corporate tax rate, we have no wealth tax, uh, we have no in, you know, inheritance tax, uh, we also have no minimum wage, right? Uh, so the idea here is that you, know, you tax everybody. Like, you, know, you have the highest tax rate in the world, but Swedes also, uh, when asked, say that the, the public agency they like the most is, is a tax agency, right? And of course, liking taxes is the sign of a high trust society. You actually think the social contract works. Okay. Uh, so we tend to tax millionaires far more than billionaires. Because the idea is you do not want to discourage wealth creation. Because if you do, there is going to be nothing to share. So that's, that's sort of the fundamental point about the, the Swedish version of the American dream. Um, thank you first for, to Julia for your presentation. I, I think it's very important and very interesting. And I think that the image that you are giving us of Sweden, it's not totally true. And especially <laughs> not true as to taxes. I mean, the Swedish multinational companies don't pay taxes anywhere. Neither in Sweden, neither uh, in any country they operate. Rich Swedish people do not pay taxes like you do. The Norwegians, the rich Norwegians, do not pay taxes. We know that after <coughs> the uh, Falcone leak, and uh, where the Norwegian tax services worked and found that rich Norwegians, in average, are hiding away about a third of their fortune in tax havens. So I think your vision of the Scandinavian taxpayers is a little outdated. Um, well, my point was precisely that, though. Yes. I pointed that out, I think, yes. so we so, don't disagree here. No, uh, well, so this can be improved uh, tremendously. And in Norway, uh, I read um, uh, an analysis from the Stortin who wanted to introduce tax reductions for political financing. So the idea is in the air, 
We don't have it today, and we should never get it, I think. Um, we know how important the financing of the political campaign is. I wanted to ask Julia maybe to, to explain us a little bit more. So who do, you, who do you put into the notion of working class? Is it all the people that are precarized? That are, and do you think that you, you should also have people by, uh, by race? I mean, I think we need to know a little bit more about this idea. Right. Very good. Lars is, just to sum up these questions or problems, Lars, uh, Lars's proposal is that you start your research, in a sense, also from the, from the other angle, from the, let's say, the countries where pathologies are not so, uh, you know, not so prominent as they are in the big countries like you know, or discrete as in France, like big countries like in, in the US. And Eva is asking you um, whether you could uh, elaborate on uh, a bit more on the, uh, on the vouchers. It's a, it's a very strange idea uh, to be willing to uh, tax billionaire land less than a millionaire. Uh, and I also think that uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, at the, at the survey that we have, uh, this kind of idea might also explain why you see less and less trust uh, of the working class people uh, in the social democrats. Uh, and I think this should be uh, part of the debate, the, the fact that you have no longer any like any inheritance tax, wealth tax in Sweden, the fact that the rich they pay less tax uh, than people that are less rich. Uh, when you lo look at the electoral scores or trust in the social democrats, I, I think this is part of the issue I raised in the, in the talk. Uh, the fact that you have a move towards pro-business position uh, for parties that was historically on the left, uh, this might explain why poor people, they trust them less and less and they do vote uh, less and less. On the, on the, on the uh, mixed assembly, I think that there were two points. Uh, the one is the working class and the, the other is whether we also want to take into account uh, the race of uh, the people to have like better representativity. And you just mentioned uh, uh, parity from the point of view of like uh, men and women. I, I, I really think that the, the fact that it was so difficult to get it for women, it really means that if we don't do it by law for the working class people, then it won't change. And the, the trend that I show you, show you France in the UK, but you have the same thing in Germany or in, in the US, they really show that we, we, we are rather like going to, to the exact opposite direction. Now, how do we define working class? This is not easy. In the, in the book, I, I spend a lot of time trying to decide uh, whether I, I wanted to use, uh, like, let's say, white collar versus blue collar, or whether I wanted to use revenue. At the end of the day, perhaps revenue would be uh, a little bit more simple uh, than to use this working class classification. Uh, we, we know a little bit how to define it. For example, if you look at the pension system, uh, retirement system, uh, you, you have a, a number of like uh, public systems uh, or that uh, are going to already classify people between like blue collar and white collar, uh, so we can rely on these uh, existing uh, classifications. Uh, but if you look at civil servants, this is the same thing. In a lot of countries, you will have different categories of uh, civil servants. So in France, you will have category C, B, A, and we know what would broadly correspond to. Uh, blue versus um, white collar workers, but for us, I income will be a little bit simpler. Income is always complicated by uh, by the fact uh, that you also have to take into account wealth, <laughs> and that uh, from times to times you can have high wealth, low income, or high income, low wealth. But I, I think it's, it's it's more of a technical uh, issue. At the end of the day, if we do agree on the fact that we want to have a better working class representation in the parliament defining the rules we want to use would be much easier. Now what is hard is to convince people that it, it's the way to go. Because a lot of people, they say we don't care. Why should we care? It's, it's not because you have a lawyer in the parliament or someone making a lot of money in the parliament that, that is, is not going to take into account the preferences of like uh, working class uh, workers. And, and, and the, the thing is, it, it has been very well documented that in fact we care about it. We care about it for two things. First of all, you have a uh, politist uh, in the US uh, whose name is Nicola Carnes, uh, who have studied for like decades, like the, the past, like since 1950, uh, in the US, uh, the vote of working class representative uh, versus uh, the vote of white collar representative. 
And what you show is that on the number of issues, tax issues uh, to begin with, they do not vote the same way. So it's not true to say that you are going to behave exactly the same way as an MP independently of your background. Your background is going to influence the way you tackle uh, the different issues. This is the first point. And the second point, I, I really think that it, it, it matters for people. The, it's, it's not, you know, I'm not going to always vote for women in elections. And I'm going to take a uh, number of different things uh, into account. And I might well uh, vote for a man rather than for a woman. In particular, these days uh, in France, <laughs> it's a little bit complicated to vote for a woman uh, in the presidential uh, elections, given that you are not no longer running. Uh, but the thing, uh, the thing is, on average, when you are a woman, or when you are a working class worker, and there is no woman in parliament, there is no working class worker in parliament, or when you are black and all the MPs are white, then at the end of the day, it's kind of very hard for you, first of all, to trust them, but it's also hard for you personally because you do not understand why some of your characteristics should reduce your probability or your kid's probability or your grandson's probability to make it into the parliament. And so I think you have two reasons. First, it's going to change the way politics works, but I really think also it's going to change the relationship citizens have to their politicians. Now, about race, it's complicated. I, I discussed it. I, I decided not to introduce it uh, for the following reason. It, it's, it's hard to define, first. And you know, like, the second thing that is kind of key is that you are French and Norwegian. I am French and Spanish. And I, and I guess in, in our two cases, we do not suffer from discrimination. Uh, because of this uh, second nationality. And we can be proud to say, okay, we have like two nationalities, we are real Europeans, we can vote in different countries, and we speak several different languages. But now it turns out that uh, if you come from North Africa, as of today in France, it's much harder to get a job with the same level of diploma, it's much harder to get a flat, uh, and it's much harder uh, to make it to politics because you are going to be discriminated. And so what a lot of people say, tends to, to do, and what they want is no longer to be defined by uh, the place where they come from. And I think that the, the thing of imposing the race, it, it's a way a little bit to freeze where you come from in, in terms of like a family background. And, and, and we should, I, I think we could find better way to fight against discrimination including in, in the political life. Discrimination in politics is a, is a topic, and another topic which is very tempting, of course, is to, to start defining what is working class, whether, who, who is underprivileged, who are the precariat, and so on and so forth. Are, all these categories demand more conversation, of course. But let's give the floor to the students at last, because uh, we have Sanne here, who is from Netherlands, as I said, where the uh, debate on participatory democracy is very alive and all kinds of experiments are being proposed. Um, now, how much do you identify with the kind of a, a repair toolkit for democracy that Julia present, presented during her lecture? And is there anything you're missing there? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Julia, for your interesting talk and uh, also for the inspiring book. Um, I think um, I will, I will uh, mainly um, think of this in terms of the uh, climate crisis, where we have been thinking uh, of it in terms of the climate crisis. And your uh, ideas are absolutely, absolutely essential to uh, reduce the influence of big money in politics, uh, uh, which today um, causes that uh, polluting industries have much uh, um, have way too much influence uh, on environmental policy making as well. So I think um, that getting rid of that influence uh, is definitely very important. You already gave the example um, uh, of the car industry in Germany. Um, and I also appreciate your uh, work on the underrepresentation of the working class and the idea of the social assembly. I'm glad that, um, that you uh, got the chance to uh, explain that a bit more. Um, and uh, your work on the underrepresentation of the working class kind of uh, prompted Hendrik and me to think a bit more uh, about the underrepresentation of a different group of people, um, namely young people. And uh, we kind of we understand young people to be approximately um, those under 30 years old. 
Um, we, could, <laughs> we could debate this, but <laughs> that's what we decided on. <laughs> um, and um, generally, those under 30 years old are uh, very much underrepresented uh, in politics. Um, first of all, the, uh, the average age, age of uh, um, members of parliament is generally uh, rather high. Um, I looked it up for France uh, specifically. France currently has four deputies uh, under 30. Um, that's 0.7% uh, of the total number uh, of deputies in the National Assembly. The Netherlands, um, is where I'm from, uh, um, the number is a bit, ho sorry, a bit higher um, with 2.5%. Um, and besides that, uh, there uh, often is a lower voter turnout for uh, young people. Um, a lot of young people don't uh, feel that kind of connection with politics, perhaps also because they don't feel like their uh, interests are being represented. Um, and then for those under 18, um, well, they don't have an influence at all because uh, they can't vote yet, of course. Um, and this underrepresentation of young people, uh, we think, is especially harmful in the context of the climate crisis because making decisions uh, about the climate requires politicians to think in uh, terms of 30, 40, uh, even 50 years uh, ahead. And so the um, and so requires them to take into account the interests of future generations. And uh, young people today will be most impacted by those decisions. Um, they are also the, uh, the ones who are most concerned about um, uh, the climate crisis or uh, ecological breakdown even. Uh, preliminary research by the University of Bath shows that 89% of those between 16 and 25 year, years old are worried about climate change. Um, and this also leads to different uh, voting behavior. We, we see that uh, young people do uh, vote differently. And um, Hendrik, um, the German elections are coming up, so maybe you could illustrate this point uh, a bit further. Like Sana said, it's particularly topical for Germany because elections are coming up this Sunday. Um, and one election has already passed, except that won't make any difference because it's just a mock election for those under 18 years. Um, and that's quite a significant shift there in that the Green Party would be the strongest party for those under 18, whereas they would be the third strongest party in the actual voting population. Um, similarly, the Social Democrats and the Conservatives would have five percentage points less in voter turnout and a whole new party would be voted into parliament if only the, uh, the under 18s got to vote, and that is the Animal Rights Party. So another one that is quite concerned with ecological and environmental issues. Um, and beyond that, the, the turnout for other parties. Um, so those that don't even make it past the 5% threshold um, is twice as high as in the voting population. So there is quite a different voting behavior there, um, except again, that does not matter to anyone they don't get to vote, even though it's not just who gets voted into parliament, but also whom younger people would vote for. Yeah. So uh, we think that in the, in the context of, uh, of the climate, um, it's especially important that uh, young people's interests uh, are represented uh, and their voices are heard. Um, so we have been thinking a bit about uh, how your ideas of a democratic renewal uh, may also uh, work for better representation, representation of young people. And uh, we have two suggestions or uh, questions uh, about that. Um, first, uh, first of all, uh, concerning the democratic equality vouchers, uh, would it be an option to lower the age from which you can start to, uh, to decide or, uh, or have a say um, in the funding of democracy? So if the eligible age would, for instance, be 15 or 16 years old, uh, young, uh, young people can already start investing in the kind of politics um, that they wish to see. Um, and then secondly, and I think, uh, um, um, yeah, I think this is uh, for us the most important uh, point, um, you already brought up the, the issue of race, which I think is very important. Um, but uh, is there, would there also be space for a dedicated number uh, of seats for young people in the uh, social assembly uh, beyond occupation alone? And um, uh, having young people in parliament may also um, uh, ensure 
um, that there is a kind of long-term uh, thinking in or, or long-term orientation uh, in politics, uh, which is so necessary to um, deal with uh, the climate crisis, and which is also another uh, concern of ours that Hendrik will uh, mm -hmm. further elaborate on. Yeah, that concerns more the second tool you're proposing, the democratic equality vouchers, where I think your suggestion is to have people distribute those vouchers once a year. Um, and our sense is very much that the, the social assembly is an essential tool to bring new points and new viewpoints into politics. But then our concern, our reservation about the democratic quality vouchers is that the potential long-term orientation by having more viewpoints represented could be offset by having parties concerned about their finances not just once every four years, but instead once every year. Um, so there is that tension between getting more people involved in politics by getting new viewpoint, viewpoints into parliament, but also, and that's a potential upside of having that annual redistribution of, of voting, fi of campaign financing, that if, if I were to turn 18 next week, for example, I wouldn't get to vote on Sunday. Um, and so I would have to wait four years before I could get involved in politics, where instead that annual redistribution of, ca of campaign financing would make that happen much sooner. Um, but we still see the tension between the more long-term focus and then the short-term concern with campaign funding. Hey, you made your point very, very clearly, both of you, so thank you. Now, this is some food for thought for you. Uh, the short-termism of electoral system, which is actually part of, uh, what, of the critique, and also the representation of the young people in the in your assembly. I think these are some really good ideas. Uh, the first one to have the democratic uh, equality vouchers uh, for people, let's say, uh, beginning at uh, 16 year old, or we, we can say 15. Uh, now you have, a, in the majority of the country, the, the voting rights are 18, but you have more and more discussion to have them at uh, 16. This uh, week in France, we have the primary elections for the Green Party, and uh, all the adults uh, above 16 are allowed to vote. Uh, and you know, when I, I see all the young people uh, around me, and the fact that, uh, you know, in the, in the street and protesting, they're making a lot of politics. They're just not going to vote. They're making a lot of politics, uh, in particular in favor of the environment. They're really involved. And, and I think we should give them more weight uh, into the political life. So the, so the fact of like, giving them the right to vote beginning at 16 and the, the right to spend their democratic equality vouchers beginning at, at 16 are, are very good ideas. And for me, it should be the same then for the philanthropic equality voters, the young people, they, 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 they spend a huge amount of time for climate, for the migrants too, uh, like working for the non-working, like uh, helping uh, the non-profit sector. They spend their time on that, uh, but they don't have money, so they don't spend their money. So they spend all their time on that, and then you have all the rich people that give money uh, for different uh, non-profit organizations. So with the uh, philanthropic equality vouchers, not only the young people will have the power of their time, but they will also have some additional money to give to these associations. And what I said very, very quickly at the end of the talk is that I, I really think that this will lead to a shift uh, in the public funding of the non-profit sectors. And it should benefit much more uh, all the, 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 the different uh, associations for which uh, young people are uh, involved uh, as of today. Now, what about the assembly? I guess it might be, uh, it might, uh, it might also be a, a very good idea. The, 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 the one of the issue we we as uh, as of today is not only an issue about like uh, let's say discrimination. So people they don't want to vote for women, or people they don't want to vote for working class candidate, or they don't don't want to vote for young. In fact, when you when you do some survey. Uh, and you ask people, you, you, you show people like the same guy with the same characteristics, uh, but in one case with a, a blue collar background and in the other case uh, with a white collar background, at the end of the day, people they do prefer on average uh, the guy with the blue collar background because he, he, he looks like them and so they, they trust him or her more. Uh, so then why do we have uh, so few people uh, for working class background in the assembly? Same thing for the young. Uh, there is a huge entry cost. So money plays a role here. You want to run as a candidate, you need to raise some money or you need to, 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 to get um, uh, your political parties behind you. And uh, it's much harder uh, for a, a blue collar worker uh, to raise some money for, uh, for the elections or to find time. You, you were right to, to, to mention this, uh, to have some vacation. But this is not only vacation to think 
about politics, also to run for politics. Uh, we, we always have this illusion that, you know, the, the, the poor, they have a lot of time, and, and the rich, they have a lot of money, but no time. I, in fact, it's not true. When you look at the data, uh, the rich, they have a lot of money, and they have a lot of time. And the poor, they don't have time. Why don't they have time? Because very often, to go to work, uh, they need to commute for one hour in the mo morning and one hour in the evening. Uh, very often, with very strange, you know, working hours. So, for example, they need to work super early in the morning, super late in the evening, in between they have no work. When they come back home, you know, they need to take care of their kids because they do not have money to pay for a, na a nanny. So they have much less time, in fact, the poor to be uh, involved in uh, politics. And the young, they also suffer from this lack of money. So uh, given that this is not about like uh, voters discriminating against the working class or against the young, but the young and the working class suffering for an entry cost to enter into politics, at least if you put this like parity in terms of age, uh, in terms of uh, 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 social background and for like yeah, women, so then you, you, you will force the political parties to also present uh, people uh, that are much younger. And you are right, this makes perfect sense because in particular when you look at turnout, the last election in France, uh, very last one uh, that took place in June, uh, the turnout uh, among people that were between 18 and 25 was 13%. That was, uh, th that is telling, yeah. Uh, now, I, I, I have a sense that what we could do now is to round up uh, certain issues which we which are left hanging here uh, and then give the floor to the audience so that the audience will get at least 20 minutes to uh, ventilate some of their doubts or questions or, or ideas with you, um, Julia, as well. So, uh, Lars, first of all, would you like to get back at Eva, at, your, at the fireside here? Uh, and uh, Julia, uh, uh, you are known for uh, being a uh, fierce proponent of, of rewriting and reimagining the social contract in Scandinavia. Could you tell us about it and how does it relate to Julia's ideas? Um, yeah, I, I touched a little bit on it, right? That the, you know, you have a social contract that's built on the foundation of, of mutual trust, both social trust and confidence in common institutions. So that's one important part. The other one is, of course, that it is a, you know, voluntary approach, right? You know, uh, so you do not have a whole lot of, of uh, excessive rules, right? Uh, but it's ba ba built more on trust. And with the financing, for example, it's interesting to, s to look at it because uh, when we look at the disclosures, right, they, there just simply isn't uh, in, in much there in terms of uh, excessive, let's say, financing by the very rich. And as I said earlier, I think that both when you look at the tax system and you, and you look at the financing of politics, uh, what, what you discover is that, you know, with, with respect to taxes, you know, in a high tax country like Sweden, we have had years of working on taxes. And the conclusion is that you want to have smart taxes, right? So you want to eliminate taxes that invite cheating. Right. Like, for example, you know, wealth tax or, or, or uh, ta tax on giving and stuff like that. Uh, so, so that's part of it. The same way you don't want to have taxes, you know, that uh, make companies, right, flee or shrink uh, or lose the capacity for wealth creation, which is the foundation, right, for a, a vibrant society, right? Um, so, so th these things hang very much together. So Sweden, and I would say most of the Nordic countries, are countries that are both very much pro-market. Right? These are some of the winners in the global market economy. Uh, but they also have vibrant civil societies, right? so you know, citizen participation, and of course a very large public sector. And it, th this is the key. You have to have three balls in the air. Right? And if you let, let's say, the state take too much of a role here to diminish the space for wealth creation in the private sector, that's going to have very, very negative consequences. But all of it, of course, is a balance, right? Uh, and in that sense, the questions that you like raises, right, you know, about undue influence through money into the politics, 
remains a hugely important point. You know, so there I totally agree. Uh, my, my argument is simply that you know, I can't really quite see it you know, if, if I look at Sweden uh, in, in the same kind of dramatic fashion right, that, that you're arguing for some, for some of the countries that you have looked at. Um, so that would be kind of my final point. And I, I think it's important right, not to, and you, you put, made that point uh, earlier, Nina, we don't want to get into demonizing the rich. Right? A, a social contract built on trust you know, goes both ways. God knows, right? We have plenty of examples uh, historically of left-wing regimes in communist parts of the world, right, that have been absolutely disastrous, right, you know, following an agenda of, of equality of outcome to the very, very extreme. Uh, so the, the wealthy people, the, the people who run companies, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, right, these are hugely important. And remember, we come from countries without a long history of serfdom, right? You know, a country, as I usually joke about, we, we are countries of free, free, small, stingy peasants that like our possessions and our freedoms. And I think that's sort of the heart of the matter, uh, why some of the sort of the control agendas, right, uh, uh, probably won't fly, right, you know, uh, in these countries. A summary of the Protestant uh, ethos now here, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I can just can yeah. say like a very small uh, word, like because you, you are talking about the social contract in, in Sweden. It, it turns out that, that there, there is a book that I, I really do like, uh, whose title is Capital and Ideology, that uh, make uh, the history of uh, Swedish democracy. And you know, until like 100 years ago, just 100 years ago, you know, very recently in Sweden, uh, the number of voting rights given to people were a function of their income and wealth. So you were in a system where the people who were rich can get as much as 20 times more voting rights than the people with uh, a lower income or wealth. So I, I guess I, I, you sh we should be pretty happy that the social contract changed in the 1920s uh, in Sweden. And then you had a huge reduction in inequality, in particular because we limited uh, the political power of the rich. It has changed again in the 1990s, beginning of the 2000s. Uh, and I think that what we see now in Sweden is that this social, social contract is not working very well uh, anymore. It's, it's not an issue of, like, you know, democratic, um, demo having a bad idea of the rich is just the, the idea that uh, the rich should pay uh, their part, we should have uh, more equality, and in terms of trust, it, it, it is going to help, because this is a country, Nordic countries, we know that trust overall is like much higher than in a lot of other countries, uh, and in particular in like a southern country. It, it's higher, but it's declining. And I think we, we should try to understand why it is declining, and the, the fact that uh, there is much more inequality as of today because there is much uh, less uh, tax progressivity uh, is playing a huge role here. Uh, just one final point here. Which, uh, which final goes, point. Yeah, final which point. goes to some of the worries that I have, right, you know, and that, that we find. The, 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 there is a, a you know, very important discussion about the crisis of democracy, right? Uh, but in, in, in Sweden, I think what we see as a threat, you know, is something that is connected to the social contract, which comes from both the left and the right, right? We see that the left, right, and you pointed to that actually, right, has become less focused on economic issues, right? Uh, they are not interested in citizenship anymore. They are sort of drunk on human rights uh, and, and think of themselves, you know, as players in a sort of a global scene. And that finds its counterpart <laughs> on the right, uh, where you know, many of the people who are rich and running companies who are entrepreneurs today right, think of themselves as part of the global market economy, where it doesn't really matter if they, Sweden just becomes another place where you can buy a country house for the, for the summer vacation. Uh, and I think here you see something that is a real threat, uh, that the older you know, generation of industrialists and, and very rich you know, people in Sweden still felt connected and responsible, right, in a kind of a patriotic sense. Um, and the same thing was true on the left. That is losing now, and I think that is a big, big threat, right, to uh, the social contract in, 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 in Sweden at least.
Yeah, this is actually, uh, this debate should be uh, the subject of another symposium, I'm afraid, because <laughs> there are so many, so many unresolved issues here. I wonder if any of you, uh, because b before we uh, let loose the audience here, any of the participants at the fireside here uh, have any extra questions? I want to ask uh, Julia how she sees the possibility for our tired democracy to cope with the the tremendous problems that we are faced with. How do you believe that we can integrate in our system the climate issues, for instance? We see here that Europe has a volonté. They, they want to act. We have many very new good rules, but uh, still we see that the companies, they have three times um, the uh, carbon charges in their accounting that we can use, and these are not changing. I read today that uh, in the Arctic we have 500 new, uh, new uh, puits that are, are starting giving petroleum, and these are accelerating the heating, so it looks like we are not able to cope with the main issue, because people have not understood yet that we are not only here, we cannot continue with wealth creation as we yeah. did, okay. and we have to make, we have to take into account this new problematic, new, it's not new, it's known for 70 it, years. Eva, Eva, you actually yeah, expressing so the concern. I want, yeah. I want uh, Julia to tell us how, how we can are we at the end of the road of the democracy that we invited in the 90s? Will, will we be able to cope with this long-term interest of humanity? Yeah, you're also expressing uh, Hendrik's and, and Sanne's concerns in, in your question. So, uh, uh, Hendrik, do anything else? Yes, I, Very shortly. Please. I would love to jump on the same point, actually, um, yeah. because we've kind of been talking about the crisis of representation as a crisis of parliaments not being representative enough and how to get more people into parliaments to make them conform more to what the voting people actually think. Um, but I think one important point to especially address climate crisis, ecolog ecological breakdown issues, would be to not just look at how we can get more people into parliament, but also to look at what people are already doing to fight all of these emergencies, um, mm -hmm. who are, for example, protesting and blocking um, the the cutting down of forests in Germany to build more coal mines, which was still going on up until last summer. Um, but also people who are building alternative communities trying to live more in harmony with the land. So it's very much that there are things already happening, except they're happening outside of parliament. So instead of getting more people into parliament, maybe, and you do touch on that in the book, in, under the title yes. of permanent democracy, okay. get more poli politics out of the parliament instead. Very good, sorry to interrupt you. While you're thinking or chewing on this question and, and how to answer it, I propose maybe we uh, allow the audience to ask a few questions or a uh, few comments on the debate today. Please, yes, Krzysztof. My name is Krzysztof Polak. I am originally from Poland. I have lived 40 years in Norway and I am a retired construction engineer. Uh, so um, I have to say that this seminar was very promising in the uh, information given before it, and, but I have to say that I'm a little bit disappointed with this seminar because the, the title of it was the Redefining Democracy. And what we uh, get through in this seminar was just quite a very narrow uh, part of the problem, problems regarding democracy. So I am aware that it's not possible to, in such a short time, uh, to, to, to discuss all the problems of democracy in general, but I think that we should at least mention some other uh, issues that are very important. We shouldn't forget that roughly 80% of the world's population hasn't experienced anything close to democracy at all. For them, democracy is just a, a very cloudy idea, and 
they have they live either in uh, autocracies or totalitarian regimes or under um, theocracy or under popula um, populistic uh, charlatan uh, um, uh, governments. Here I mean mostly the countries that recently get, got out from the communist uh, system and then they tasted the sweet taste of democracy in several decades and then they just uh, apparently rejected the democracy at least and then gave their votes to political charlatans. Yeah, but Patricia, if I can stop okay, you, okay, okay, in, okay, there are many countries in which you should actually start from building democracy, and, yeah. and we, this wasn't the topic. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about the renewing or rewriting or reimagining democracy yeah. as it exists uh, today. So you were touching upon a very important topic, but I'm afraid that this would be again a theme for another yeah. symposium, I'm afraid. My name is Carl Christian. I teach fifth and seventh graders here in Norway, uh, so I'm a teacher. Uh, and I thought the premise of your book was fascinating uh, with the idea of giving a, a voter uh, 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 Vouchers. Voting vouchers, that's Democratic correct. election vouchers. Yeah. That's correct. Um, and but I think it leads to a proliferation of a lot of different parties, right? Because obviously it gave me a lot of funding that parties that would never have gotten a voice, right? Uh, and then it leads to a different conflict, which is, again, also mentioned in your book, information. So how do you get information about all those different parties that all of a sudden get a lot more power to the people that could potentially then give that power to them through these vouchers? So my question is, how do you avoid the over bureaucratization of these new parties coming into power? Because you're gonna have this tremendous proliferation of new parties. Uh, and then also my second follow-up question is for a two-party country like America, which I come from, which is in many ways a broken system, are you then proposing an entirely new political system? I think Julia, you uh, pointed to the fact that pro-business uh, was becoming a dominant mode, even on the left. Now, to me, it seems that this might not only be because of perversion of political influence, but perhaps also reflecting a reality in today's world. Markets are global and politics tends to be very local or very national. Are the nation states in some sense losing it? And are the people who say it doesn't matter? Maybe a little bit true. Business has scaled up globally, Eva Jolie is one of the sharp uh, hunters of all the tax paradising around, but this is just one phenomenon. Politics hasn't been able to scale up at a level where it really has muscle, uh, except maybe in the US. Uh, and here is a paradox, because can we really have a vibrant democracy at the European level? I, I think one, uh, and this is my final comment. A German minister of um, foreign affairs, I think it was. Uh, I don't remember his name now, but he was here in Oslo. And he said, and this is maybe 10, 15 years ago, he said, uh, being a politician at the national level, in government at the national level, is really playing in the elite league. Of course, in Germany, you're uh, pretty, uh, pretty tough. But being a European parliamentarian is not a league over. It's a league under. It's a league with much less influence. So we're not able to scale up politics to a level where politics can have the muscle to matter. <laughs> and that is, of course, one of our big paradoxes. Uh, do you have any comments or ref reflections on that? A mismatch of politics and business, uh, and there was a question here. Right, please. Hello. Uh, first, thanks to the students for bringing the topic of climate change to the debate, which I think was largely lacking. Um, so my question is actually that um, I, I fail to see the link between improving democracy and fighting climate change or providing climate justice. I don't see how those things are linked. Um, I suspect that for what you've been saying is that 
private uh, wealth. Wealthy people are basically trying to uh, stop regulation from stopping climate change. So it's basically like the wealthy are the enemy here. But then, then again, we see, for instance, 2018 France with the Gilets Jones. It was the blue collar workers protesting against the, against the carbon taxes because climate regulation brings higher prices for everyone. So I just would like to hear more about the link between um, better democracy and climate justice. Thank you. So if, are there any more? Yes, there is one more question, please. Yeah, my name is Andrew Crogland. Um, I'm, my question also pertains to Europe. I um, mean, you know, I have this discrepancy. You have the national governments who are not democratic enough, don't open enough for, for democratic space, and also have all these money issues uh, to, 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 to combat. Then you have the European Commission with the most ambitious uh, green plan ever, Fit for 55, uh, and, and, and forcing all the European governments, even the Norwegian, to be much more ambitious on climate issues. How would you, in your sort of scheme, um, explain this, and what is the potential? I want to take on a bit of uh, Hendrix and Eva's word, because I, I mostly I want to comment on uh, the process, one of the most beautiful and inspiring democratic process of the last time that I think has been the uh, constitutional process in Chile, that's the country I'm from. I don't know if uh, you know a lot about it, the people who are here, uh, but in 2019 there was a lot of protests, and long story short, it ended up in a, in a process where we decided to uh, vote for a new constitution. So also in what you were saying, I'm, I'm thinking maybe in the way of we, we, we can rewrite democracy, it would be good to do it in this way, by rewriting constitutions. And the way that this, this is happening in Chile is that uh, there was a paritary election of uh, the people who constitute this, this new institution that is writing the, the new constitution. And uh, it has parity in gender, it has a uh, representation of all the districts in Chile. Uh, instead of normally, uh, most of the participatory processes are mainly distributed between uh, the three richest places in the capital. But now we have representation of all the country and we have representation of indigenous groups. Uh, there was a particip participation specifically for, for the different uh, I don't know, ethnic groups, uh, different sectors. So I think if, I wonder if you think this is a good opportunity and a good uh, chance for democracies to renew themselves by creating these institutions to uh, find new rules for the democratic system. Julia, there's a lot on your plate here. We started from the uh, democratic vouchers and the uh, danger or hazard of proliferation of small parties. Yes, uh, 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 this is a very good point. So I, I didn't have time to enter into the details of the proposals. But what I say is for the same way when you have like uh, proportional representation for elections, you have a minimum threshold to enter parliament. Uh, that varies, it varies between 1% and 5% in the majority of the country, it, uh, it's equal to 5%. And so what I say to avoid this uh, proliferation of uh, political parties is to say that no party will be um, uh, able to benefit from these democratic equality voters if it receives less than 5% uh, of the total amount uh, of the voters. And in case you give like to a super small party which is going to have less than 5%, then your voters is going to be split according to uh, the, the choice made by the other voters. So exactly the same thing then in a proportional representation system. I think it's a very good point. By the way, we can discuss the threshold. Perhaps 5% is a little bit too high because you also wa want the emergence of new political parties. We might prefer three or, or, or one, but for sure we, we want to have some. In terms of the issue of information, I, I, I think, I, I don't see a risk here, I see an opportunity. Uh, one of the big issues for me uh, with the, the democratic systems is that very often the uh, parties that are in the opposition, they tend to be very lazy. And for three, four, five years, uh, when they are just in the opposition, they, they don't really work. They don't really make proposals or counter proposals. They, they just tend to protest. Uh, with the democratic equality voters, given that you will have to convince citizens on an annual basis, it means that you will have to make some concrete proposal and propose alternative policies. So you are going, in fact, to uh, create a stronger link between citizens and the political movements to, uh, you, you will have like more information that is going to be provided 
to citizens, and I think political parties will have to involve citizens also uh, a little bit more. So I think it can be a way to rebuild trust in a sense uh, between uh, citizens and the, and the political parties. Uh, regarding, so I'm trying to, to merge uh, different questions. On, on this uh, issue of like democracy and climate change, and given that you mentioned the, the yellow jackets, uh, I, I think you, you, you are uh, wrong in a sense in, in your analysis of the movement. For, for sure the yellow jackets, Gilets jaunes uh, movement in France, which was one, one of the like, uh, biggest protests we had in France since, uh, in fact, uh, 78, uh, it was a huge social movement. Uh, the people did, did protest against carbon tax, but not because it was a carbon tax, because it was one additional tax on people who had not enough money to make it at the end of the month. It can be done differently. In a number of countries, for example in, in Canada, uh, it has been done differently. You have the introduction of the carbon tax, so you do that because you want to limit the carbon emission, but then you take the revenues from the tax and you distribute it to the poor people. So you want to change the way people consume, and you want to change the way poor people consume, but you don't want to tax poor people more than uh, rich people. Uh, we are in a world where like, poor people, when they have to take their car to go and work, uh, they have to pay a lot of tax, while when rich people they take a plane, we still don't pay a tax uh, on the kerosene that is used in the, in the plane. And actually what is very interesting in terms of, you know, like whether or not it's linked uh, to the uh, political power of the rich, I, I do think that it is linked to the political power of the rich. And in fact, you see that very clearly in the data. Because I if you take uh, like a country like France, for example, and if you look at the carbon emission of the bottom 50% of the population, if we were all having the same carbon emission than the bottom 50% of the population, in fact, we will reach uh, the Paris objective. Uh, just because, like, Poor people they have less money, and so they emit uh, less, um, less pollution. Uh, so the, the, the big issue is really more on the, on the side of rich people, and then of also rich countries. So you have a rich country problem, but at the end of the day, we don't have just to compare it, to compare, sorry, like rich countries and, and, and poor countries. You have to look like globally on how much rich people emit, uh, including rich people in poor countries versus poor people, and all the, like, the bottom 50% of the population, in fact, they, they, they don't consume a lot of carbon just because they don't have enough money uh, to, to, to do so. So this is really a, uh, an issue of the way rich people influence politics and their, their consumption pattern. Now we are back to, uh, and I, I'm not going to answer everything like about uh, Europe. Uh, I think that there is one thing that was missing in the, in the debate in the Sunday, which is the issue of lobbying uh, on, top of, uh, on, on top of the rest. But, uh, one big issue with uh, what is happening today in terms of Europe and the like, climate agenda is really the lobbying by not only by the, the rich people but also by the firms and uh, the, the fact that corporations they, they still have a huge uh, power to try to influence politics. Uh, on, on the issue of the uh, of the of the of the young people, in, in a sense, can, can, are we able? Uh, to change the, the, the way democracy works today and uh, are we strong enough, in a sense, uh, to uh, take uh, the, the, the issue of climate change seriously enough to fix it? To, to be totally uh, honest, I, I, I don't think you and I, uh, Eva, uh, are, and, and I think we are already too old, in a sense. And that's true. Uh, and when you define the young like below 30, Perhaps it should be defined even like below 25. Now when we talk about young people, something that is really like uh, striking is the fact that the, the, the way you consume is different. Because you have already taken this issue of climate change into account in your consumption patterns and in the way you live. And I think it's much harder for people that are like just like uh, even above 30 years old because we are used to consumption patterns, like for like the past 30 or 40 or 50 years, you know, it depends. And it's very hard to move back in a sense. And this is where you are right that one of the solution is really to uh, give more power to the young people uh, and to let young people enter into politics. Now, I, I really think that we should let young people enter into politics. 
I, I, I think this is about politics. I think this is not enough to protest in the street. And this is not just about like we should uh, give like more voice to the young or like more voice to the all the non-profit organizations fighting against climate change. They should enter the parliament. Uh, they should enter the national parliament and they should enter the European parliament because this is at the end of the day where the, the, the political power is still at play. And I think it's, you know, young people are going to do better than us, but they might also like uh, make some mistake and where they tend to, to, to make some mistake as of today, I think, is when they believe that it's no longer about politics because they don't trust politicians, they don't trust political parties, they should act differently. In fact, they, they should like enter politics and change politics because this is like the parliament is still the place uh, where the, 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 the where we can uh, change the rules of the game and what we really need to do in terms of taxation, climate change, redistribution, democracy is to change the rules of the game. And for that, uh, you need to be an elected politician. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we are nearing the uh, end of this symposium and uh, people want a break because the uh, seats here are definitely beautiful but uncomfortable. So I, first of all, I'd like to bow to all the, uh, to Julia and to the audience and uh, to the participants of our five debate and uh, to our sponsors, the Norwegian Research Council and the University of Oslo. Uh, uh, and in particular, I'd like to thank um, a group of young people, actually, who are going to change the world, I'm sure, uh, who I would like to bring on stage. Martina Marcelova, please, come in. Without this woman, this uh, symposium would have been a, one big heart attack. Uh, and I had two heart attacks yesterday <laughs> when we were almost on the bite to cancer. Yes, definitely. Anna Rio Eriksen, who is uh, representing Zoom here. Where is Anna? Yes, definitely. Uh, Christopher Ring, who is not here. Our fantastic students. Anna Henrik Jenna. Where is Jenna? Who was going around with the microphone? Here she is. Uh, and April, of course. Where is April? Oh, uh, yes, right, very good. Uh, Piotr Kuzinski, Manhar Patel, and the Center for Development and the Environment, thank you very much for uh, staying with us, debating with us, and I hope to see you next year uh, in the same room, same time probably, but this time uh, full house. Okay, thank you very much. For <laughs>